Hello guys, uh, thank you for coming. And uh, today I'll be sharing about how I found 19 NPM malicious package. And first thing uh, about me, my name is Kwang, I'm a final year uh, CEG student. My interest lies in computer security, IoT, and guitar music as well. Uh, in the summer, I interned with Veracode, and this is the project that I have done with uh, Veracode. There are actually two uh, employees at the back who are from Veracode, and uh, yeah, they are hiring. <laughs> okay, so uh, malicious package, as you can see here, this is uh, an NPM advisory. Some of you might be familiar with it. So I found 19 malicious packages, and I um, reported to them. So at the, at the end of the talk, uh, you might discover, and you might want to discover, and, and then have the name in the Hall of Fame in uh, NPM. So uh, let's start. So the contents I will cover will be a static analysis, what is that, and train, taking, uh, train tracking, what is that. Then I move on about uh, how I do my scan for eval function, which is kind of a dangerous function in JavaScript, and also um, uh, my scan on malicious packages. So let's start with static analysis. Static analysis, um, method of uh, debugging based on only the code. And uh, static analysis can actually be used to de detect bugs and vulnerabilities in the program. So an example of a static analysis program is ESLIN. Yeah, very familiar. Um, so ESLIN used static analysis to identify rules that you have already uh, mentioned. And uh, if you think about it, ESLIN can be used to detect vulnerability as well. Because there are actually rules in ESLIN which cover security. This is one of such example. This allows EVA. So EVA is a very dangerous function in JavaScript. Um, it basically lets you uh, execute a piece of code. And uh, in this example, it will execute object.x, which will result in foo. So, um, ESLIN is able to detect this method alone, but is it able to detect that this is a vulnerability? Well, this is not a vulnerability because key is literal x, so it's basically calling object.x. That's not a vulnerability. But if this key is an user input, then that might potentially lead to a vulnerability. So in order to find out whether or not key is a user input, we use TIN analysis. So there are two main concepts in TIN analysis. One is a source. Another one is a sink. A source is basically where the data come in, and uh, a sink is where the data come out. So in this example, there are five, uh, five lines, uh, six lines. And this is an example of a code that is vulnerable to cross-site scripting. That means you can inject this script, and then you will be able to execute the script. So let's go through this example. So A is request.get parameter. It's basically try to get the retrieve the get parameter full. And this is a thing because that is where, uh, this is a source because that is where the uh, attacker or the user can input his input in. So through a bunch of assignments, uh, for example, B equals to A, C equals to B, sub dot something, D equals to C, and then E is equal to something D. And then you move on to the sync. So the sync here basically just write down uh, E in the browser or whatever is running this program. So that is the sync because that is where the program uh, produced the, the output. So the 10 analysis try to evaluate if this E, this variable E, is tainted by anything that can be input by the user. So the way that it does is that E is tainted by D because of this method. And then it trace back D is tainted by C, and so on and so forth, and gets back to A. So the input of the user, which is A, will directly affect the output, which is E. And that is how the cross-site scripting is enabled in this case. So there are many complications in intent analysis. It's not as simple as just you know, assigning and then whatever behind the assignment is what taints uh, the variable. Um, there might be multi-parameters. In this case, there are multi-parameters in a big program. There might be different data structures that affect the intent analysis. In this case, it's the hash map. 
which might affect the attend analysis. And there are also a bunch of functions and objects. And most importantly, in uh, security, we care about the sanitization methods. So is the input by the user sanitized anywhere between the sink and the source? Yeah, so um, that is basically what you need to know about static analysis and ten analysis. Um, to do this, I use an algorithm for JavaScript to build a ten analysis. Uh, it's called approximate core graph, or you can call it ACG. Um, this algorithm has been reviewed by papers uh, to have high precision, and as most importantly, it's very efficient. Um, so I will explain how the algorithm works. So given a simple piece of code on the left, x equal to a plus b to the a var x, you have a representation on the right side, which is called ASD uh, graph. And for static analysis, people usually use this graph to, um, to do the analysis on the source code. So um, the ACG, basically what it does is that it will traverse this graph, and then uh, while it's traversed this graph, it will be the ten, uh, tainted graph. So I will explain. So when it traverses down to this assignment, on the left you have x, on the right side you have an arithmetic operations which include a and b. That means x is tainted by a or b and b. Also means a and b taints x. And all after that it traverses up and then move on to the next statement and so on. And that is how the, the algorithm, uh, algorithm basically works. It's basically transversing uh, the graph. And um, what I did to this algorithm is that I changed it up a bit so that it's more suitable for the application of fighting security bugs. So security bugs, especially um, dangerous functions like evaluate, does not frequently uh, occur in the source code. So it will be inefficient if you scan all the libraries and then build the core graph or the tainted graph for every single library. You only want to build the tainted graph for the libraries that have dangerous function, and that, and you only want to build the part of the graph that is related to that parameter, that uh, variable alone. So instead of doing um, from top down, that means from the program, and then traverse down the normal way, I would do it from the bottom up. That means I identify whether or not the dangerous function is there, and then from the dangerous function, I trace back to the top of the tree. So let me explain again. So it's the same piece of code, but now you know that the dangerous function is here, eva, and the, the variable is a. So what my algorithm do, instead of going from program down, it will just trace from a here. So trace up to an assignment, uh, assignment operation. And then you know that A is tainted by A only. And that's all it's going to do. So basically, it will only traverse this part of the graph instead of the whole program. Yes. So um, in a top view of uh, the, what the algorithm do, um, it will first trace all the variables in the nodes. That means how to find this eval, and then trace whatever inside this eva function, it will try to trace back of what is the source of this a. How, do, how does it do that? Uh, by adding intra-procedure edges, adding inter-procedure edges, and then go back to tracing variables in the node. Basically, it's a loop. And it will stop until all the nodes that, all the re relevant nodes are um, uh, being inspected. I will explain what add intra-procedures and inter-procedure edges mean. So in intra procedures edges are basically the operation that is only happening in that uh, particular procedure yourself. So some of the example is this. So if you have uh, an assignment like A equals to B, that means A is tainted by B, or B tends A, right? And some of the other example includes A equals to B or C, that means B or C will tense A. Yeah, so as I travel, uh, traverse the tree and then uh, arrive at some node, I will inspect what kind of node that is 
and then based on the type of node on these procedures, I will add the relevant edges to the tainted graph. Right. Um, and on the third column is a score. The score here is, is a score of uh, confidence. That means um, if the score is zero, I have utmost confidence that um, the edge is the correct edge. And if the score is higher, then I have less confidence of that edge being correct. Right. So a good example is A equals to B or C. So in where in runtime environment, you will not know that A will take the value of B or C. So when you do, on, uh, when you do static analysis, um, I will just assign A to be tainted by B and A to be tainted by C at the same time. So this is an overestimation because in runtime, it can be tainted by only one variable. And that's why I increase the score. And the purpose of the score is that I want to keep the analysis as precise as possible so that I can achieve uh, a more efficient uh, code. Yeah, and uh, so each triple C just quite simple to think about. Uh, what's more important, uh, what's more complicated is the intra procedures edges. That means um, all the edges are added across the program. That means there must be some kind of function cost or something. So um, in the case of A equals to FB or new FB, that means A is equal to some function call with uh, the parameter of B. Uh, there will be uh, edges from A, that means the variable, to B is the input to the functions. And similarly, A will be tainted by uh, the return value of F. So you can kind of see of uh, this kind of more complicated because you have to draw an edge from the declaration of the function, which is stored somewhere in the code, and then the actual call of the function of a variable somewhere else in the code. Yeah. So uh, these are the only operations that is needed in the algorithm. And after the algorithm is run, then what you have is a tainted tree. So using the same example, uh, the tainted tree will be x tainted by a uh, and b, or a, b taints x. y is tainted by a, b, which is because of this. And then a taints itself because of this. OK, so um, the tainted tree is of a uh, is already obtained, and I will use this tainted tree to find the vulnerabilities. Um, so uh, I want to find all the vulnerabilities related to the EVA functions. So using static analysis, I try to find all the occurrences of the EVA call functions inside the code using this, and um, identify what is the argument of this EVA call functions, and find the tain graph of this argument. Yeah, and uh, this will be done in when I traverse the whole uh, ASD tree of uh, the program. After finding the taint tree, then I would, I would use this taint tree to apply the filters on it. That means, is, ad is there anywhere in between the tree that there is a sanitization? Or is there anywhere inside the tree that one variable has a source of a parameter. I will explain this more. So sanitization filter, the purpose of this is to reduce the false positive of finding vulnerabilities. Uh, for example, in this case, we have the EVA payload. And this payload is tainted by the variable request. And assume that the, the request come from the user. So it's easy to see that this can be a vulnerability because payload is tainted by the user input. However, in between, there is a function called remove blacklist, which can act as a sanitization. That means the payload here uh, will be safe to eval. And those are the cases that I want to find with sanitization filter. Um, the way that I use to filter this is by heuristics. That means um, any method that contains some kind of keyword 
like sanitize, blacklist, whitelist, or replace, I just consider it as a sanitization method. Yeah. Uh, source type filter. So um, in this example, the EVA function is here, which is called an R0. And R0 is something that is literal. And it's not um, input by the user. And in this case, I would say that it is not a vulnerability because, well, it's, it's not input by the user. Yeah, so using those, these two types of filters and putting uh, the tree as an input to these filters, uh, I will able to scan all the results. And these are the results on a set of, uh, of um, the, the top, I think, a top 1,000 or something libraries uh, in NPM that start with J. And the most important thing to take away here is that with no filters, that means with no chain analysis of all, then there's, uh, there are about 180 libraries that are identified. But using the chain analysis and all the filters, you can reduce it uh, by three quarters. That means there's only over, just over a few 45 uh, libraries left. Yeah. And yeah, using this, I was able to find some uh, exploitation for some of the libraries, which I will introduce here. Okay, so this library, what it simply does is that it it converts the data to a table. So it provides a convenient method to uh, you know ch to just input the data in this field, and then you have a table in HTML. And one of the way that you can uh, so using the static uh, static analysis, I was able to find that there's is a way to execute code in this in this data field. You just escape it out using this, and then you can basically execute any kind of code here. So here, I, for demonstration purpose, I just alert something like uh, malicious. Yeah. Another example is here. So this library J2N, it's converts a string to an uh, object. So uh, again, using static analysis, I was able to construct a payload that will execute this piece of code. So for demonstration purpose, I just num equals to 666 and then console log num. And then you can see in the execution, uh, yeah, the console log was executed. Yep, and that is for the scanning for eval uh, dangerous methods. Um, next, I want to scan for malicious packages in NPM. And if you don't know, malicious package has been very popular these days. It's one of the easier way for the attackers to uh, run code in the, the user website or whatever the user use in their applications. Um, an example is like, this library, when it's in installed, uh, it will run an executable targeting windows and upload information to a remote server. So I want to find all these uh, packages on NPM. Uh, there's a pattern that I recognize with these uh, packages, and uh, I would use these patterns in my static analysis scan. So um, I uh, list five patterns here. Uh, these malicious packages are often obfuscated with Base64 so that uh, the people who read the code cannot understand what it really does. Uh, it must, uh, must be sending a request to um, a server or something because that is what the attackers really want to do. Um, Sometimes it attempts to read sensi sensitive files like uh, password file, SSH file, and they usually run script in the post-install and the pre-install field in the package.json. So um, the code that is written in this field, post-install and pre-install, will automatically run in your environment when you install the npm packages. Yeah. And these packages are often typo squad as well. That means uh, they have like an extra X or MongoDB without uh, the correct 
uh, yeah. Uh, so I did a scan uh, using the same uh, method, using the same static analysis, but without the ten uh, analysis because ten analysis is not really effective here. And I found a bunch of libraries with this malicious code, and this malicious code basically send the information of the host name and whatever type of uh, OS that uh, the environment is running the program to uh, a server online. And uh, uh, it's a Chinese server. <coughs> so uh, yeah, and uh, these are the list of the libraries. And I will go through the ways that these library execute the, and the malicious code. So there are four ways. The first way is that they can require the file in the index.js. So when, the, when you require the library from uh, another program, then that library will automatically uh, execute the .test malicious code. Uh, another way uh, is to uh, include the code inside the package.json. And the fields to, to, to include them are the install field. Oops. Install. Uh, it's pretty small. But yeah, I just tell you the field is install or post-install or pre-install. This will automatically run uh, the malicious code. Yeah. And yeah, in conclusion, um, over the course of uh, three months, I found 90 malicious packages and four libraries with a dangerous use of the Eva function. And I think that um, any one of you can do the same thing. And I really think that um, the security in open source uh, libraries is very important. And you know, for bug bounties uh, programs, you usually need the skill of uh, manual inspections. But for open source libraries, there's no way that you can inspect because there's too many open source libraries. So uh, static code analysis is probably the best way to find the vulnerabilities and keep the open source library uh, safe. Yes, and that's all. Uh, if you have any questions about the project or about Veracode, you can uh, ask the two guys. Can you raise your hands? So mm. what you're doing here is manual, right? Or do you plan to automate this? Well, the Static, um, the static analysis is not really manual. I mean, the manual part is to write the code. Um, after the static analysis is run, it will produce a kind of all the libraries that m might potentially have the vulnerabilities. And then I will look at these libraries and then do a manual inspection because you can never trust it to the 100% that there will be vulnerability there. Yeah, and most importantly, when you try to submit these things to uh, any kind of advis advisory, uh, you need to come up with an exploit. If there's no exploit, they then going to ignore your, your, your post. Yeah, I guess what you mean by automation is like, like you have to automate the code you have your GitHub has, for example, like Git Secure or something which runs across different uh, repositories. And oh, oh and yeah. So Oops. Yeah. Um, so, uh, 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 so um, there's actually API on NPM. So I, I, I use the infrastructure built by Veracode to scan through all the libraries automatically. But if you don't have that access, you can use the API from uh, from NPM and then retrieve the library names and then download it to uh, somewhere in S3 or your computer, scan through a library, delete it, and then do that again. Yeah. So for those keywords itself, right, different libraries, they use different keywords for the blacklist and white right? So do you have to actually uh, look through every single library to identify it? I just look through the most popular one. Yeah. yeah. How would you tell that it is a white list or blacklist? Well, I don't need to tell whether or not it's a white list or is a blacklist method. I how do you tell that it is a sanitization method? Yeah, um, 
so I use heuristic because there's no way that you can static scan a, a method and then know, where, know that the method is a sanitizing method. So I just base on the name of the method. Um, usually people will not use uh, user-defined uh, user defined method to sanitize the output. They will usually use some kind of sanitization uh, library from NPM to sanitize the method, uh, the input for them. Okay. Yeah. So the other thing is that the graph thing that you showed, right, how does it work? How, how would the graph for a recursive function look? How does the graph for the recursive function looks like? Uh, hmm. So, <laughs> I cannot draw it here, but so when you traverse the tree, it just deficit, and then you found something, and then well, while I transverse the tree, I take note of all the um, locations that is related to the point down here. So when I found the variable here, I look through all the references of that variable and then use the same method to walk up the tree uh, till the point that I don't want to walk anymore. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you want to know the details, uh, you can ask me later. Okay. Um, well, like, will your app be compromised if you install a malicious package right, accidentally, but you didn't import it? Like, wow. Because of like, typo, then you install a malicious package, but like, you didn't use it, will your but it depends on how uh, the malicious package is um, designed. So if uh, the malicious package have the malicious code inside the pre-install and post-install packages, then once you install, like npm install some package, then your environment is affected. Yeah, and the only way you can reverse is just to reinstall your whole environment. Yeah, but if the attacker is, um, is more kind, then it will just execute the malicious code when you call some kind of functions or when you require the library. By, by like remaking your whole environment, right? Do you mean like just an NPR install or like you have to reconfigure the whole thing? Again? Well, the, the attackers can basically, because he, the, the, the NPM package manager, they have the rights of the user who is using that. So basically, the attacker can install any backdoor anywhere in, in the computer. So yeah, uh, by environment, that <coughs> means the whole machine. Okay. Yeah, unless you put it in the sandbox, that's correct. So if you have like any more questions about details and stuff, uh, you can approach me later. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Quan. So, uh